Uh, we work for 52 Inc. in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, we're a team of about a dozen people that do mobile app, website, server, and back-end development uh, for a variety of clients. Uh, so today I'm going to take you through some open source topics in iOS development. Um, we're going to start with managing dependencies with CocoaPods and Carthage. We're going to explore some great open source components you can put into your projects. We're also going to explore the Swift problem, um, which although I'm kind of a Swift hater, not on this specific point. Um, next thing, we're going to look at some plugins with Alcatraz and some plugins that I really like that make my development workflow a whole lot better. And then we're going to look a brief introduction to Fastlane build tools, um, take a look at some, some great things you can add to your continuous integration environment. And then last, we're going to go through some UI design with Dan uh, via open source uh, materials and components. So the first thing we're going to start off with is managing dependencies with CocoaPods. Um, how many of you here are familiar with Coco, CocoaPods? OK, so some more than a few of you. Cool. So this is probably going to be um, a repeat course for you guys. But I imagine most of you probably haven't used Carthage. Anyone here use Carthage? No? Cool. OK, so um, I'm going to run through CocoaPods for everyone who isn't familiar with it yet. Uh, so what is CocoaPods? First off, it's a dependency manager. Um, it'll download, install, update, and um, archive third-party components you use in your application. And the great thing is, since it is a dependency manager, if your components have dependencies, it'll go out and get all of those for you, like most other ones. Um, it'll also integrate components into your build process. So with one line, it'll configure your Xcode project and tie all of these things in for you. And it'll track licenses, which is a really undervalued feature, I think. Um, it'll collect all of your open source licenses into one file for you to distribute with your executable. Um, so what is this? Um, this is probably a little hard to read um, on the small of the screen. This is a pod file. Um, it's where you can define your open source dependencies. Um, and I could, would zoom it in if I could, but uh, over here you have a pod and you name it. And CocoaPods is centralized, so I can just give it the name of the open source component I want, optionally with a version number, and it will go out, find out where it lives, GitHub, uh, SVN, Mercurial, uh, really anywhere, including local file directories, and pull it into your build process along with its dependencies. So the contents of a pod file. Um, you can specify your development platform and OS version. If you would like it to compile using frameworks instead of just a static library, you can do so. It is re required for Swift. And then you include all of your pods and version numbers. So the cool things you can do extra that I really haven't done in this file is you can specify the ver specific versions of your dependencies. So if they do a breaking change, uh, it doesn't break your app. You can choose a specific repo and version dependency, um, which is nice because I have forks of pods that I maintain myself that have different features or different things I've customized. And so I can still use their pod configuration but point it at my fork of it. And it'll load it in with all the dependencies just like the person who created it. Um, you can put in pre-install and post-install scripts for if you'd like to copy files or you'd like to modify the automated um, uh, pods project configuration. For example, whenever Xcode 7 came out, you had to have it disable bitcode on all of your targets um, until all of your frameworks were able to support iOS 9's bitcode. Uh, that's less of a problem now a few weeks later, but it was great to have that ability um, in your pod file. You can also specify a local directory if you're developing a pod or you just have local Git repositories you don't want to put out public or you don't want to pay for a private uh, hosting account. And so you can do that locally. Uh, there's a whole lot more you can do in your pod file, but those are really kind of the big ones. Um, so I'm going to take you through installing CocoaPods. It's super easy. And so um, it's a gem. It's a Ruby gem. So you can just install it with uh, gem install. And it's going to go through. And now I have CocoaPods. Now this actually takes a lot longer in real life. I have sped up most of the little terminal scripts you're going to see. This actually takes several minutes the very first time you do it. And then after that, we're going to take a look at a base Xcode project that I've got created. So I just made one on my desktop, just called my app. And you'll see that whenever I list the contents, it's got a folder and an Xcode project, a pretty basic setup. So we're going to create a pod file template. And so we'll run pod init. And pod init is going to create a default template pod file that we just saw. It's not going to have any dependencies yet, but it's going to have some options. And so we can take a look at what's inside the pre-configured pod file. And so right here, we have our app. We have commented out a platform and a frameworks option. And typically, you uncomment one or both of those, depending upon what you're doing. So I've taken the liberty of adding dependencies to my pod file, which you guys don't see because this is a cool video. So right here, I've added some. You can see it a little bit bigger here. And so I've added a couple of pods. Some of them have version numbers or um, specific major versions I would like it to keep. It can keep getting bug fixes with the little tilde arrow. 
And so this is a lot of pods. Um, these can be pre-compiled binaries, like a lot of Googles. Um, they can be source code at downloads and builds on your machine. Uh, there can be a lot of variety. You can even build resource pods. So <clears throat> now we're gonna run pod install. Um, pod install actually goes out, looks up your dependencies, fetches them, clones them to your computer, builds them, puts them in dynamic frameworks, and then generates an Xcode workspace that includes your project, a pods project, and links all of them together into a framework for you. And so <clears throat> this is downloading a lot of them. Again, I'm going to skip through this one because this actually takes a few minutes if you have big ones. And so now it's completed. So we're gonna look and see what exactly it just did to my folder. So you still see I have my app on my Xcode project, but I have a workspace file, a pod file, a pod file.lock, which maintains specific pod versions. That way, if I check that into a repository and I wanna clone it three years from now, I'm not subject to whatever the current version of a library is. It's actually locked the version for that specific file. And you'll see my Xcode project is still there, but you actually can't use it anymore. You have to use the new Xcode workspace it generated with all the pod configurations. Um, this is actually a pretty big point of contention um, for CocoaPods, and this is the reason why I was a couple of years late on the bandwagon, because um, it makes me uncomfortable to let automated tools dramatically screw with your build environment without telling you what all it's doing and letting third-party authors define what they wanna do to your build project. And then on top of that, not giving you an automated way to undo it. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that Carthage was created that we'll talk about here in a minute. And so once we get into Xcode, um, I'm taking through some of the things that's changed because it is quite extensive. You can see we have a workspace, so we still have my app, but we have this new pods project. It contains our pod file, and over in our pods project, you can see it's generated a dynamic framework for all of these. And so uh, a couple of them are dependencies that it'll highlight here in a second but all of these are now being compiled individually as frameworks linked against my project and I can use them. And uh, like that one right there that is highlighted was a dependency of the one below it. It's not one I explicitly included myself. And so there is a risk with dependencies you're not aware of. You need to make sure you track your licenses because I've had some before. There were this awesome MIT library that incorporated three GPL components. So there is a little bit of risk into letting people define dependencies, but be careful. Uh, down here, it has linked in the pods framework that the project compiles. It also makes changes to your build settings. And so over here, it actually has a build script and a build configuration that pods created automatically without asking me. And it will overwrite anything you have here. Um, so it's something you have to be very careful of. And if you just type the word pods into your uh, build settings, you'll see it's modified a ton of things that third party authors have put into your project. Um, this is good because it lets your pods work. It's bad because it doesn't tell you what they all are or where they came from. And you also see it adds some build phases. Um, so it can slow down your build depending on your machine. Uh, if you run it on a fast enough computer, it's probably negligible. Um, but if you have a lot of frameworks, as it can result in some slower compile times, which is another thing that Carthage aims to solve. So <clears throat> what are some criticisms of CocoaPods? Well, the main things is, it's very, very invasive. As you just saw, it modifies a lot of things. Um, it doesn't tell you how. You can't undo it automatically. And so you're really kind of at the will of the authors of the components that you've used. Once integrated, it's entirely manual to remove it. It's very complex and breaks between Xcode versions. Modifying Xcode projects and not being Xcode is a very kind of tedious process. Um, and so what's happened is it used settings that didn't work in Xcode 7 with the new iOS 9 stuff, and so you had to run beta versions of a ton of things to get it to even compile your app running for iOS 9 until they've managed to fix everything. And it enforces a specific project structure. Not everyone likes using Xcode workspaces. Not everyone's comfortable with the organization and the file layout that it uses. And there's a lot of debate whether or not you even wanna check in dependencies into version control. Um, and so these are kind of some points of contention that over the few years that CocoaPods has been around have been tried to be addressed by other developers. And the most successful of which was Carthage. The whole point of Carthage was that it doesn't touch your Xcode project in any way. It is 100% up to you to integrate the frameworks at the end of the process. Uh, it doesn't enforce using workspaces since it doesn't touch your project. It's up to you to integrate the frameworks, like I said. It's decentralized, so it doesn't have a central lookup. You just point it at a GitHub repository. Um, it does only work with GitHub and Git right now, so it's not as flexible as CocoaPods in that respect. Um, and it uses dynamic frameworks unlike CocoaPods, which will eventually compile itself into a static framework, so it is iOS 8 plus only, which is fine because iOS 8's already you know, a year old now. So, um, so what is this? Well, like our pod file, we have a cart file, and it has a lot of the same things, although it's much, much simpler. 
Uh, we have the source of the component. We only support GitHub and Git. We have a version number of the component. And it can support uh, making sure you maintain the exact same version or it can look for a specific major minor that's allowed. Um, as with things that break and another Swift thing, there is a command line installer for Carthage, like CocoaPods. It doesn't work on OS 10.11 because Swift 1.2 doesn't work on OS 10.11 with your modern install of Xcode. But you can grab the package installer and it takes about five seconds. This isn't even sped up. It takes five seconds to install Carthage and then you're good to go. So back at our Xcode project, I've emptied it out and reset it so it's just a clean Xcode project again. So we're going to add some things to our cart file. And once we've added it, we can take a look and see what exactly is in it. So there's a lot less things that support Carthage, as you saw from the giant list uh, that I had in the pod file. These are the ones that actually worked in Carthage. So we've got that. So next, let's install Carthage and download some app dependencies. So uh, just like we had pod install, Carthage has an equivalent command. Unlike CocoaPods, this will actually check out, clone, compile, and build frameworks in this step. So you only do that once, um, unlike CocoaPods that does it whenever Xcode feels like it wants a fresh build of things. Um, and so this actually takes several minutes. I have sped this up substantially and chopped off a couple of parts of it. Uh, this took about five minutes on a 2014 iMac uh, with an i7 in it. So it's pretty slow, but you only have to do it once. So it's really fast at build time. So let's see what Carthage did. Now I pulled it up in Finder, um, which again, probably a little bit hard to read in the back. Um, to see what it did. It's much easier to look at in Finder than in Terminal for this. Um, so we have a Carthage resolve file, which is it went out and found the current versions if you didn't specify of what exactly it found. That way you have a lock file just like CocoaPod. So you check that into your repo and if you ever have to check to do this again, six months down the road for this version, you have the exact ones that you built, you built and not an unknown current version number. Um, we also have the build where we have got all of our frameworks that are already compiled for us. And so the great thing is they're already compiled. I can drag them into any kind of build process. And it means it's not slower to compile. It doesn't need extra project settings. It doesn't need really anything. Um, I can integrate them as I see fit. And it's very fast. So here's all it is to really integrate Carthage frameworks. I go into my Carthage build folder. I'm going to select all of the frameworks. So I think there's six here. I don't remember the exact number, maybe seven. Uh, and then I'm gonna go over to Xcode. I'm going to go to my project, and then I'm going to go down here to where your framework dependencies are, drag them in there, and then you can run it, and they're all there. So super easy to add, but you do have to do it manually. Now, this app right now will actually crash if I were to actually run it, um, because unlike CocoaPods, you have to be very, very careful that you've also linked against system frameworks that your frameworks use. Um, for example, this isn't linked against um, at the moment, UI kit, foundation, uh, security, and a whole handful of other ones that this thing uses. Um, so you do have to be very careful in a less automated process. So the next thing is let's explore some CocoaPods. So we've seen two great ways to add some things to your project. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on things with CocoaPods because it's a lot more dominant than Carthage. However, many of these, actually most of these, do work with Carthage as well. So the ones I'm gonna be going through are Swifty JSON, Keychain Access, Alamo Fire with kind of AF networking if you're doing Objective-C, JL routes, object mapper, and just a few useful categories that I think add some things that should have been in uh, foundation in the first place. So first thing is Swifty JSON. And again, this is probably a little hard to see. Um, so if you are familiar with Swift, um, it's very specific about its typing. Um, it doesn't like optionals going places they're not supposed to be. It doesn't like unknown types. It doesn't like any kind of not knowing. Um, as a result, it's really verbose to, let's say, traverse a JSON structure and pull out something and then convince Swift to accept it as a string, and if it fails, you're just kind of out at any step of this process. So what Swifty JSON does is it provides um, a syntax very similar to NS Dictionary's literal syntax, where you can just kind of bracket address with a name, and so you can just go down keys and then tell it what type you want, and it'll coerce it to the right type if possible and provide it to you so that Swift accepts it. Um, if it doesn't, it provides nil, so it is an optional but it's a lot shorter syntax. It's two lines versus five or six lines. Um, and it still uses NS JSON serialization internally, so you still get the great JSON parsing that um, Foundation provides. The next one is keychain access. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has tried to do keychain by hand. Uh, anyone? Anyone. All right, so 
you're probably familiar with the unpleasant experience that is Keychain. <laughs> Um, so I didn't put it up here, I put a one line little comment. It's way too long and verbose and full of objective C to C bridging and even worse than Swift um, to even write up here. It's way too long. And so the cool thing is this library, and there are several like it, um, makes it to where Keychain works like a dictionary. You just put whatever your key is in uh, a literal and then you can just assign values to it and read values to it. It makes keeping your app secure so easy that there is zero reason not to have everything you do in your app pretty well encrypted at this point. Um, and it has a lot of other things. It also supports Touch ID, so it gives you a very easy interface to Touch ID um, versus the more verbose one that the C-based uh, keychain API provides you. Uh, next up, we have Alamo Fire. Um, if you've done much iOS development, you've probably encountered AF networking. Um, Alamo Fire is the successor to AF networking uh, written in Swift. Um, Depending on the project, I usually use AF Networking or Alamo Fire if I'm going to bring in a third-party networking library. Um, a lot of times I don't. I stick with NSURL session unless I just need a special special behavior. But it does shorten a lot of things because without Alamo Fire, you have all this because all the error checking is mostly up to you. And with Alamo Fire, you can have it just validate things for you in a couple of lines. Really great. The biggest benefits that I find to it, because I don't really necessarily mind the verbosity of without it, is that uh, rather than doing delegate callbacks for progress and uploads, um, it provides it to you as a block. And who doesn't love blocks? So it provides a lot of convenience methods that NSURL session doesn't. It's easier to do certificate pinning so that you can keep your app secure so that you can't have man in the middle attacks as easily. And then it can automatically encode get and post parameters, which if you've ever had to use um, NSURL connection or NSURL session with form parameters on post requests, um, if you've never written a manual HTTP body creator, I say try it sometime and then be thankful for networking libraries because it's not fun. Um, and those are some great utilities that Alamo Fire kind of provides to you for free. Uh, the next two are some of my favorites, um, JL routes. So now in iOS 9, we have universal linking to where you don't have to use these crazy URL schemes anymore to open your app. You can actually just pick up links to your website uh, for example, if you were to go to facebook.com slash a profile, the Facebook app could actually pick that up, see the profile, read the URL, load it up for you. It's awesome. Um, however, it's been a little difficult in the past to parse URI strings. Um, because obviously, you have to deal with URI compliance, you have to deal with um, validating whether or not you fit use cases, dealing with templating, uh, when you should and shouldn't accept URIs. Jail Routes makes this easy by allowing me to define a block with a supported URI. And over here, you can specify variables. So like I've taken three of these URL routes and called one of them object, one action, and one primary key. And it will auto let you pull these out of a dictionary. So it parses the URL, sees if it matches. Really nice. And so if I have a URL down here like for a marketplace, I can see if it matches each of these, pull all of these out into variables, and then take them to that spot in my app. It's really convenient for users because none, no more of this like press button to open something, no more of getting bounced to apps you didn't intend because everyone declares the Twitter URL scheme. Um, and this also works great for push notifications. Um, if you include just the URL, the web URL that your server generates in your push notification, you can pass this through your, your routing library and then go right to where you want it in your app. And there are a lot of apps that do the lazy notification way and I've been guilty in the past of doing it as well. Uh, there's really no excuse anymore. We have some great routing libraries finally in iOS, and we have uh, full support for universal links. And with uh, things like this, we can make app experiences really great when it comes to linking directly into deep, deeper parts of your app. So my absolute favorite one is Object Mapper. And most of the ones I've mentioned work in Objective-C or Swift. I'm not sure this one works in Objective-C because it creates custom operators, but um, it's really cool. So over here on the left, we have um, your typical deserialization file into an object model. For example, if you're pulling down JSON from a server, you deserialize it into a data model. Um, like a lot of people, uh, this one was auto-generated by, um, I believe that one was JSON Accelerator. Some people use Objectify. And if you have a massive API, you can run into dozens and dozens of these things. Um, this entire file, which I'll show you in a second, is actually way longer than this. Um, with all the safety checks and everything to do this by hand, which is faster than some key value methods you can use with frameworks, um, can be minimized into this. It's very, very short. It includes all the safety checking, 
And even better than that, uh, this one over here doesn't parse uh, dates and it doesn't parse URLs and turn them into NS URLs and NS dates. Over here, I add one little parameter to this and it'll convert it to an NS date from an epoch timestamp. It'll convert it to an NS URL if it's a valid URL. And there are all kinds of other goodies. It can parse all the way down a chain. It can do arrays of your custom data models and it can do uh, structs. It can do just about anything you throw at it. And it's very, very actively maintained, so there's all kinds of new features being added. But again, when you compare it to the actual way to do this with all the safety checks for encoding these objects and decoding them, it's much, much shorter. <laughs> so a couple of quick categories that really add some things I think should have been in foundation to begin with. Um, NS timer blocks, super tiny. I think it's like a 12 line uh, category. It adds block support to NS timer, so you don't have to make NS timer call a method. You just NS timer, scheduled timer with block, put your code in the block, and tell it if it should repeat. Easy. The next one is uh, UI image resize magic. Uh, because we get a lot of image asset resources, sometimes hundreds in a project, you can't always get the perfect size for the perfect device. And so you end up resizing them, or scaling them, or doing weird things to them, um, especially if you have to crop them. What this does is it provides a very, very easy one-line way to resize images. It's no faster than if you were to do it yourself, but it's a lot less verbose. And it supports respecting aspect ratio, it supports distorting on transforms, it supports scaling to a max width or max, max height, all with one line versus I would have to do math myself, which I didn't hear, as well as deal with all the graphics context and pulling it out. Whereas down here, I have one line to pull my image in at the size I'm wanting to use it at. Um, it doesn't respect, um, Screen DPI, so you do have to deal with that part yourself. But it's still really nice as a little convenience method. So um, next one is NS date extensions for iOS 7. Uh, this is originally based off of um, NS date extensions provided by Erica Sadoon as part of her iOS 6 cookbook. But to go with some iOS 7 compatibility, someone has done a variant of it that I like to use. Um, it adds a bunch of convenience things like, is this date today? Is this date this week? Is this date the same week as that week? Is it you know, X, Y, Z, it just answers date questions. Um, and so anything you want to do with dates, you could of course do it yourself, pull it out into calendar components, compare numbers, compare years, compare all sorts of things to see if it's correct. Or you can just say, is the same week as this date? And it'll answer it for you. So the next thing is to talk about the problem with Swift. Um, and this isn't necessarily a criticism of the language. Um, it's more of we've, there's been a trend going on in the open source world of everyone jumping on the Swift bandwagon, which is fine. A lot of people like Swift, it's perfectly fine. Um, however, if you've noticed following Swift, Swift code written in April doesn't compile today at all. And so it's led to kind of a, kind of a graveyard of code. A graveyard of tutorials, of sample code, of open source libraries, of developer tools, of plugins, of a lot of things. And so people are running into issues, like I mentioned with installing Carthage, where they wrote it in Swift 1.2, and then they try to clone it and compile it and install it on your system, and it fails. Or I'm using 15 open source libraries, one of them was written in Swift 1.2, and now I can't work on Xcode 7 or iOS 9 until that one developer fixes it, or I have to fix it myself. So depending on how complex of a library, like for example, if Alamofire had decided they weren't going to upgrade to Xcode 7 until it came out this fall, my entire app would be held hostage by the developer that was maintaining it because they didn't want to upgrade it to Swift 2. And I can't compile Swift 1.2 with Xcode 7. And so there's becoming a very real problem of people are incorporating libraries left and right, often with Swift, and not realizing you need to, one, make sure you trust the maintainer to maintain it for you, make sure you understand it well enough to have to fix it yourself, um, and three, that there is a very real chance the person's not going to update it until two days before iOS 9 comes out and your app is going to fall apart and there's nothing you can do about it. And so this is more of just a word of warning um, that if you're going to include open source components that has a language with a kind of constantly changing syntax, a lot of open source code, a lot of things that won't compile, um, you need to be very, very, very careful using Swift components at this point in time um, because you can't compile older code and newer versions of Xcode. Uh, there's not even a compatibility mode for it. So, just a word of warning. Uh, the next one is Xcode plugins. Um, developing in Xcode is a great experience unless you've had Xcode crash on you, which I'm assuming everyone who's opened Xcode has had Xcode crash on you. 
Um, a lot of crashes can be attributed to plugins, um, and it warns you about them now, but in my opinion, a lot of them kind of outweigh some of the risks they add. Um, so Alcatraz is an open source uh, package management system for Xcode. And so it'll download and install code bundles into Xcode that you can use to make your development experience better. So uh, installing Alcatraz is super easy. You go to GitHub, you copy the uh, command line script, you have no idea where it came from and what's on the other end, you paste it in terminal and what's the worst that could happen. So it's gonna install Alcatraz in this case, which is super quick, that was actually real time. Um, and then once it's done, you can open it. And uh, there are tons of these. I don't know about hundreds, but it sure feels like hundreds when you scroll through them, of things people have written to enhance Xcode. And so I'm gonna take you through a few of the ones that I really like um, that save me a lot of time. The first one is VV Documenter. Um, this is a method, it's got a lot of parameters. You wanna document this so that you have um, documentation you're auto-suggesting, or if you run Apple Doc, or um, a number of other documentation tools, you have H pretty HTML documentation and code. Um, so what this does is I click on it, I type three forward slashes, and suddenly it auto expands with uh, tab completion for all the places you need to actually add into your comment. Again, it's not something you couldn't do on your own, but sure makes life easier. And then the next one is uh, if you're going to use CocoaPods, there is an Xcode plugin for it. And so it adds something up into your product menu. Go to product, CocoaPods, and you can install pods, update them, do whatever you wanna do, and it'll run for you. And the third and last one is a white box. Not really. Um, so people like Dan and other image-oriented people like to give me a lot of image assets. And so I have projects that have hundreds of image assets in them. Um, and if you've noticed, Xcode doesn't auto-complete image names. They're strings. You have to go and look them up in your asset catalog. So what this does is it indexes your asset catalog and adds them to Xcode's auto-complete, which is the greatest thing ever. So I can see here, I can pick the one I want and I've got it and even see a preview. And whenever you have hundreds of assets in all kinds of selection states or animations, it's really great to find the right one without going to look it up. And so this is the point which I'm gonna touch briefly on Fastlane. Fastlane is really, really large and complicated, um, but I'm gonna touch on a couple of them, of the aspects I'd like to kind of just make sure people are aware of. Uh, Fastlane is an automated deployment tool. It can control build pipelines, it can control distribution, it can control provisioning, um, it can even control iTunes Connect and Test Flight. Um, it's a really, really neat set of tools. Um, and I've got three highlighted here that I'm going to touch on um, that are great, but all of them are worth checking out. So the first one is Psy. Um, so those of you who are iOS developers, I assume you have worked with um, the wonderful experience of doing certificates and provisioning. And if you've ever done more than one developer account on your computer, like I think I have 12 or 13, Xcode just likes to break things. It just determines periodically, I don't like what's going on, and then just wipes out things without asking you. Um, the whole point of Psy is to fix that. <laughs> um, I can just type Psy, and it will go into, it will log into Apple's Developer Center, fix all of my certificates, fix all of my provisioning profiles, and get everything back to the way it should be, and then delete all of Xcode's mess off my computer. I can also delete expired profiles, expired certificates, a lot of things like that. And uh, the developer named it after kind of the feeling you get whenever you wake up and realize Xcode has just screwed over my entire development uh, code signing setup. And so you can just type Psy, log into to iTunes, and it will take care of it for you. The next one is Spaceship. Um, the, uh, the author of Fastlane originally wrote it to scrape iTunes Connect and the developer centers to do what it does. Um, and he rewrote Spaceship to, be, to power all these tools um, by reverse engineering the APIs that iTunes Connect, the Developer Center, um, Xcode itself uses to manage these things. You can make API calls and not scrape web pages. Um, he released it not just as a component of his tools, but as a component itself so that you can write scripts in Ruby to manage iTunes. So if I had, for some reason, I wanted to create 50 apps, I could write a quick script that will generate 50 app entries, fill them out with screenshots and all the data, pull down provisioning profiles, code sign things that I have on my computer, and then push it all up into test flight. Um, and it can all run within a minute. Um, so it's just an exposed Ruby library for all of Apple's developer APIs and all of their de developer centers. And it powers the rest of these tools. And the third one is Pilot. Um, this is for managing test flight from terminal. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the new iTunes Connect UI that rolled out a couple of weeks ago that made test flight somehow worse. Um, 
But Tesselite can do some great things. It can do distribution of up to 1,000 people. You can have, um, I think it's 10 or 15 internal users. And then it can also do A-B testing and a whole handful of other things. But you have to do it through, um, through iTunes Connect in your web browser, which means that if you want to do automated delivery, for example, uh, we have one set up where we do continuous integration. When it passes tests, it auto uploads into iTunes Connect and sends it out to um, beta testers who are on the list to receive fast builds. Um, and you can't do that with iTunes Connect because it's not meant to be automated. So what Pilot adds is a build step I can put in my continuous integration or build deployment pipeline that will auto push the stuff to test flight and auto send it out to my testers for me. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dan now to discuss a little bit of open source UI as the last part of our presentation today. Hold up. There you go. Thank you. Okay, yeah, um, I'm going to run through just a few um, open source resources. Um, that can really enhance your user ex experience and UI. Um, so the first one we have is Jazz Hands. Um, it's um, a keyframe-based animation frameworks. So um, and it's controlled by gesture. So one example is the IFTTT app here, um, and it does progressive um, percentage-based animation. So I'm going to kind of run through here. You can see as you scroll through the app and kind of you can go back and forth with your gesture. Um, it kind of is dictated by the percentage that you uh, scroll through. Um, so it's a really great um, for onboarding animations, opening animations that can really set you apart. Um, the next resource is Font Awesome, um, used by a lot of web developers um, originally. And um, it's probably 600 icons. Um, and they're a little bit more diverse than maybe a native iOS um, set of icons that you can use. So really great, again, to set you apart. Um, and this allows you to use it with Swift and um, in a lot of your iOS apps. So great library and um, icons that I'm fond of. Um, again, <coughs> icons are really important on my side of, of um, what I do and being able to communicate um, actions and, and things to users. Um, this is another one, is the Material Design Icon Pack um, that came out with Google's Material Design Guidelines about a year ago. Um, and they're probably a little bit uh, more simple than um, the Font Awesome Pack. Um, and probably same thing, about 600 or a few more um, icons. Um, the only thing that I would kind of warn about these is if you're going to use these and kind of go this route, it's best not to mix them with native iOS icons um, and be consistent in really choosing that route um, and using them fully throughout your apps. Um, but again, really great icon pack. Um, the next I'm going to talk about is um, Facebook Pop. Um, so Facebook Pop is very similar to Jazz Hands. Um, and I have an example of something we did for a client that utilized Facebook Pop um, as well as some core animation. Um, it's differs, and I think Brendan can talk on this a little bit more from that aspect, but differs from Jazz Hands and the fact that, um, like I said, Jazz Hands does a lot more percentage-based progressive animation um, that you can kind of tween back and forth uh, through. But um, this allows you, as soon as you swipe on, for example, here onto this next screen, this animation runs. Um, it also allows some like physics-based um, things to, to run through. And I don't know if you want to talk on a few more yeah, of uh, points of it. Grab the mic. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, Jazz Hands does progressive based animation. It gives you essentially a percentage and helps tween the animation between two states in accordance with the percentage complete between the two states. Um, this is more of one shot animations. It was written to power Facebook's paper app. Um, and so it allows us to do better physics animations, um, a lot of responsiveness, uh, a, lot of, a lot more springiness than what the iOS uh, native libraries do. And so um, I think uh, Dan was going to touch on. Yeah, 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 I just wanted to touch on a, probably a key point um, about uh, just to kind of follow up. And I, you know, Brendan had, had mentioned a couple things too that, that goes with it. But um, the first point would probably be uh, to make sure you're consistent uh, with your decisions and your uh, UI. Um, like I mentioned with that material design icon pack, um, you know, just make sure you do, you utilize those fully and try not to mix too many. Also, there's so many different components 
um, and resources out there that are extremely flashy and trendy and um, trying to kind of slam a lot of those all into one app, albeit tempting, uh, may not be the best result. So kind of choose the best um, ones that are fitting for your content and your content. Um, and then the second point was to um, be maintainable and manageable. Again, Brenda touched on the, uh, the Swift problem. Um, from a user experience standpoint, a lot of that can cause crashes um, and major bugs and issues in your app. Um, and if you're releasing that out and it's the first experience that um, a user has with your app, um, even if it's fantastic but crashes or has, has a major issue from that, um, it takes a huge amount of uh, effort to get that user back and using your product. So um, make sure you choose carefully on some of those. Yeah, and kind of on that topic is that um, a lot, of, a lot of libraries you want to look for active maintenance because if it is a really cool UI component you've based your app around, like a, a lot of people, um, is that if it's not being actively maintained and then iOS 9 comes out and you have no idea how the cool fancy thing works and then it breaks or suddenly your users start crashing on it, uh, just because it looks cool when it works 70% of the time doesn't necessarily make it worth keeping. And uh, it's something that comes down to kind of developer responsibility is make sure you either know how to maintain it or make sure it's actively maintained. Um, for anything, because you do want it to enhance your app, not just be in your app. Um, so that's what we've got prepared for you, um, and we were taking any questions if anyone had any. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the So right now, Swift doesn't have um, binary interface compatibility, so you can't actually put Swift 1.2 code in a project with Swift 2 code. Um, yeah, so Carthage doesn't, doesn't solve that yet either. But um, just hypothetically, if we assumed that it did work, um, you also come with the problem that right now, because it doesn't have binary interface compatibility, um, Swift libraries are not bundled on the device. They're actually compiled into your apps. Putting Swift in your app adds 20 to 30 megabytes to your download size. Um, now imagine if we did that for two separate versions of Swift because they weren't compatible, we've now added like 70 megabytes to our download size. So I don't know that hypothetically it would be a good case, but currently it's not possible. Maybe someone will make it possible in the future. Anyone else have any questions? Hi, yeah. No, it can, it's written in Swift, but you can use it with Objective-C or Swift. Fantastic, I didn't know that. Cool, um, and I think material design icons, you just drag them into your, your asset catalogs as well, so. Um, I, I would say, kind of what Dan touched on, I would say be careful using them, um, because they're not in, neither of them are in character with iOS. Um, iOS uses a lot more simple, geometric, pictographic things. Um, neither of those really do. And so as long as your app's whole personality is not using any of that, that's totally fine. You just don't want to mix and match, so. Anyone else? Or is everyone ready for lunch? <laughs> All right, well, cool. Uh, again, I'm Brendan Lee. This is Dan Marino. Um, and I guess we are done. Right, that is a perfect 40 minutes. Look at that. Hey. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs>